Welcome back to Better Health. I'm Dr. Stowe. You've probably never given much thought to your gastrointestinal tract or your GI system of your body, unless, of course, you get sick with an upset stomach. But did you know that your GI system has more nerves in it than the entire rest of your body, including your brain? I wonder why that is. Or more importantly, what is so special about our GI tract besides digesting food? Well, here to answer some of these questions about our GI tract and why it's so important to our overall health, I want to introduce you to a good friend of mine, Dr. Arlen Hill. Dr. Hill is a licensed doctor of chiropractic, but also has a master's degree in public health, and he has a diplomate in clinical nutrition, and he specializes in what is termed functional medicine. Arlen, welcome to Better Health. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Tell us, tell us what's so important about the GI system. Well, really, if you, if you look at the gastrointestinal tract, it's what I would consider the foundational system in the body. I mean, uh, when, when you look at taking in food and digesting food, that, that food becomes life for the rest of the systems in the body. And, and if you can't do the basics of digesting food and assimilating it and getting it into other systems to be utilized for energy or, or um, health and healing of that system, those systems really can't be functional. So if someone has a GI issue, give me an idea of what some of the symptoms they might have. Yeah, and, and it's actually quite diverse because you can, you can probably break that down into two categories and you can look at it as symptoms that would be strictly gastrointestinal related and then those that might be outside of the gastrointestinal tract. So for the ones that would be GI related, you would think about very common things like um, belching, bloating, um, maybe someone goes to the extent of having something like an ulcer and then lower down in the gastrointestinal tract you would begin to think about things like uh, excess gas, uh, even maybe some bloating in the lower colon, those types of things. Um, so very strict GI type, type presentations, but then there's the group of diseases that are, are really, at least in part, pretty heavily GI oriented that are not what we would typically think about as gastrointestinal in nature. And I'll give you some examples on that. Please. Um, things such as autoimmune conditions have a very high correlation. Um, I, I've even come across some studies showing a very direct link between cardiovascular disease and, and, um, and gastrointestinal dysfunction. Okay. And it really, it, to, to some degree, with, with the majority of chronic diseases, you can probably find some, some link in there showing that gastrointestinal uh, dysfunction is a contributor to that. They, um, they're putting up on the screen a portion of what is termed leaky gut. Can you kind of describe what's going on here right now? I, I can. And, and, and when we talk about leaky gut, leaky gut is more of a, a lay term. Yes. Um, it's kind of the generic term that we refer to. This is also termed a hyperpermeable gut. Um, but what you're seeing in the presentation here is you're, you're looking at food particles that are coming through, and there could be some, some other um, potentially microorganisms or things of this nature circulating through your GI tract as well. And what's this stuff down here? That's going to be the food particles as they've been broken down to a small enough size they're being assimilated across that gastrointestinal lining like they're supposed to. That's ideal. So this ideal. is the lining of the stomach. That's the lining of the stomach. The larger molecules that you're seeing there, the bigger white molecules that are floating off, that are floating off those are either something that is like a microorganism that should not be able to cross the lining or it's an undigested food. And now it's gone to a? It's gone to what we term the leaky gut at this point. And why, why do you call that leaky gut? Well, what you're going to see is that the, the gastrointestinal tract is very selective. It, if a food particle does not get down to a small enough size, it's not going to be absorbed. Okay. Um, and, and, but what happens in these leaky gut type scenarios, you'll see that there's a gap in between these individual cells here. So now that selective permeability that the, that the gastrointestinal tract had where it could say, wait a minute, you're, you're the right size, but you're not, it loses that. Okay. And what begins to happen is that those food particles that were too big begin to leak across. They begin to squeeze through these cells. So these are individual cells and now they've got these gaps and they're missing some of the portion it looks like where the circle's been drawn. Now, what causes this? What You, you had the healthy gut earlier. What causes this type of presentation now? What causes this? Yeah, and, and that list is actually fairly long, but you know, there's some, there's some ones that are fairly common that come up over and over again. And, and I would say the most common ones that I see are a, an unhealthy diet. Uh, if you look at some of the things that are very common to uh, most American diets, yeah, a high sugar content, 
um, lower or inadequate protein in some segments of the population, um, alcohol consumption. Um, those are, are dietary aspects that will cause this. If you look at non-dietary, antibiotics have a real prominent history of creating situations like this. So someone who's taking a lot of antibiotics for some it, other infection. Yeah, now exactly. what the, the demonstration is showing now is these large particles that were floating by are now getting down through the cells. That's right. Now, the, let's that, say that's a bacteria. Is that fair? That could be a bacteria or a virus or something? It, it could be. And where is this? Where is all this stuff going now? Yeah, and if, if, <clears throat> if we had it, you would see that under this layer of cells, you have your blood flow. You have your blood vessels very close in that area. Right. So with, within those blood cells, or once, the, once these food particles or microorganisms cross that lining, they're going to make their way into circulation. This is really going to have probably more to do with food particles than microorganisms per se, okay. to, to a large degree. And, and what happens when you get to that point where you've started leaking foods across that lining is that now you, and you're in the circulation, within the circulation you've got a constant supply of white blood cells or your immune system cells. Right. And what these immune system cells are going to do is they look at that as they look at that food particle as being too large because again remember it needed to be broken down to a small enough size mm -hmm. and if it didn't the immune system tags that and says well, wait a minute you're too large we should probably be reacting against you because we don't recognize you as a food particle anymore we recognize you as a foreign substance now okay so now you begin to elicit an immune response to that this can be problematic because when you, when you look at it over time, the more often that the immune system sees this, it begins to develop memory to it. And the, the stronger that immune response becomes. And really, when you're looking at this, you're, you're beginning to progress with, what, with the whole inflammatory cycle. Um, and as, as we've come to learn that with inflammation, any chronic disease has a degree of inflammation related right. to it. So that's really, when we, when we mentioned earlier what the connection, that's really your connection. Is that, the is, it's the inflammation that gets created related to that. So tell me this, because it seems today two things. A, I see more patients that are complaining of what they call GERD or, or the gastro reflux symptoms. Right. And they're being prescribed these over-the-counter Nexiums and Prilosex and all these things. And what I've learned is that maybe that's not the best thing in the world to have. Can you, can you comment on the, the GERD symptoms, how they relate to the diseases, and also the antacids? I, I can, and I, I, think, I, I think the assumption out there is that for most people, it's, there's, there's too little acid. Or I'm sorry, there's too much acid, there's too much acid. That's the assumption. That's the assumption. The reality? the reality is that there's too little too acid, little. yeah. Right. And if you really look at what stimulates the body to produce acid, you you quickly come to realize that we're probably not producing enough. Okay. Right? And so what happens? People eat this bolus of food. There's not enough acid sitting there to digest the food, and what? It ferments. It ferments. It begins <laughs> to ferment, right? Folks, for fermenting, okay, we're making beer, we're making, we're making bad stuff. We're making very bad stuff in the body. Right, right. And, and I mean, I think that's where, you know, the, the reflux begins to come in because if you look at the, the, the valves that really regulate food, the direction that food's going to move, this valve on the lower end is fairly strong. And if it's not going to open up because there's not enough acid there, then there's really only one other direction that can go, and that's back up. Right. And the valve up at the top is pretty weak compared to the lower one. Right. Right. So what happens is this food is fermenting. It's creating a gas because it's not yes. got enough acid. And that's what causes the indigestion when people feel the heartburn. Yes. They can feel that bloated feeling an hour or two after they've eaten. So what are the ramifications of that? Now, they've, got, they've eaten two hours later, they're still bloated and full. Tell me, because I have patients myself, they'll say, well, I take my antacids. And I'll say, well, how long have you been taking? They'll say, for years. And are you taking the same number? No, they're taking more. Tell us a little bit about antacids, why they work, why they don't work, and what sh should they be doing? Well, really, for most antacids, if you, if you look at them, they're really supposed to be used for a period of about 14 days. Right. So beyond two weeks, you should be looking for another option or trying to figure out what else is really occurring here. And folks, that's an important part. People, I've had patients, and they're on and on and on these things for months and years. Dr. Hill sees this all the time. If you're on it more than 14 days, there is something wrong with your system. Go right. Ahead. And really the implications to this become that if there's not enough acid available, then the, the digestion of food, specifically proteins, doesn't occur. 
uh, and, and that really gets you into the fermentation process. And then you begin to not extract the nutrients from your food that you need to. Things like B12, iron, zinc, these types of nutrients. And, and you end up manifesting deficiencies in those. So the, the implications are fairly numerous. And there. they're widespread. They're throughout the whole body. That's correct. So I know what I do, but what do you recommend for those patients who come to you with these type of leaky gut, antacids, those type of symptoms? What do you recommend they do? Well, there, there's, there's two ways to look at this. One, we do try to, to deal with the symptomatic aspect of it. So I do want to give them the immediate relief. For example, with the, with the reflux, given that that's not enough of an acid, we actually supply hydrochloric acid. It's an easy pill that the patient can take, uh, and it begins to produce relief right away for they them. They take so it with a, food. They take it with food. It's a quick, easy fix most times. But then beyond that, we begin to look, well, why, why was this patient not producing hydrochloric acid in the first place? And we try to work on the lifestyle style aspects to that. When we're working a little lower in the colon, uh, small intestine, that large colon area, we're getting into these leaky gut type scenarios. There's some very specific nutrients that come into play here. Uh, things like glutamine, uh, zinc comes into play again. Uh, nutrients of this nature. But then again, we also address the lifestyle component where we're trying to m remove some of these offending agents uh, that I had mentioned previously, some of these inflammatory type foods. So tell me this, if, if all this stuff that's not supposed to be in our body is getting in and if we're not getting the nutrients we need, I know that about 60 to 70 percent of our immune system comes from our small intestine. I would have to assume that that's got a disruption in it also and which would cause our whole immune system to break down. Th that is correct. Um, you know, and probably the best example I can give you to that is the autoimmune, autoimmunity and the connection between leaky gut and autoimmunity and how significant that becomes. Um, really, you can't manifest a strong immune response if the gastrointestinal tract is not healthy. It, it's just the two are very integrally connected and you're looking at on the order of probably somewhere around 60 to 70 percent of your uh, lymph tissue or your immune tissue is in and around the gastrointestinal tract. So once that GI tract starts breaking down, the immune system around it starts breaking down as well. Which could obviously lead to some systemic diseases that we've been dealing with that have been on the rise. Name, we've only got a few minutes, but name a couple of those systemic conditions that could be caused, could be caused by this type of immune breakdown. Yeah, I'll tell you some of the ones that I've been seeing quite a, uh, an increase in recently. Um, the Hashim uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, okay. that's a, a big one that's uh, increasing. Uh, now for the audience, is that hyper or hypo? Too much, too little? It's hypo, it's too little. Too little thyroid. It's too okay. little. Um, and then rheumatoid arthritis. This is another one that I'm seeing quite a bit of. Rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Um, so where you're actually getting the immune system to start attacking the joints. Right. Um, and, and then probably some of the uh, more neurologically oriented diseases. Uh, really? Things like multiple sclerosis, things of this nature. Okay, we've only got another minute or so, but tell us quickly, if someone believes they, maybe they've got leaky gut or they're taking the antacids or you know, they want more information, how, how should they go about finding someone like yourself or what questions should they ask? How would they find somebody to help them get healthy? Well, I think that really comes down to differentiating how you look at your, your gastrointestinal health. The common, the common uh, allopathic approach, use that term earlier, that common approach is to look for a very gross abnormality, so to use a scope. Scope down through the mouth, scope a colonoscopy, either, either way. Right. Um, but those have to see gross abnormalities. If it's not there, then it, it doesn't exist. A, a better, more sophisticated approach is to look at um, some of your different types of stool tests or urine tests that look for things on a microscopic level. Okay. So really asking, asking the clinician, do they offer testing that can look at things on that microscopic level? Folks, we're almost out of time, but I want to thank Dr. Hill for coming in. I think we could do one or maybe even two more shows Arlen, thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to be back in a minute and go to the segment on Ask the Doctor. And this is where you, the viewing audience, can ask questions. We'll take one last break and we'll be right back.